So what is motor learning, first of all? So I've defined it as the process of learning or relearning sports movements. Um, I also like to kind of term it into accuracy training, or what some people might call movement memory. Um, you, might, you might have heard the term muscle memory before. That's probably a less accurate description of, of movement memory. So most of our movements are generated by our central nervous system, not particularly by the muscle site itself. So I, I like to use the term, which I think is more proper, as a movement memory. So these are some of the items that motor control learning are trying to develop. It could be accuracy to the board. It could be repeating a release point. It could be repeat mechanics when you're fatigued or when you're not fatigued. Um, these are the issues that motor learning is primarily concerned with. Okay, so in motor learning, when we're trying to train or have athletes learn specific movements or patterns of movements, um, we're really concerned with two things. We're concerned with instructional factors that have to deal with when to give instructions, how much, how mu how much instruction to give, um, how to provide it, and what to provide. We're also concerned with practice-related factors. Um, how much to practice, how to practice it. Think of practice-related structures as a recipe, kind of like a cookbook. You might have all the ingredients, lifting weights, technique, biomechanics, etc., but you need an exact recipe in order for your athlete to optimally remember these movement patterns that you're trying to convey to them. So think of this how to, or this practice related factors issue as the recipe, okay, the recipe for your athletes learning the particular skill. All right, so our main goals uh, for this particular session is going to be to at least get at this particular question. Why can my athlete do it in practice but not do it in competition? We're also going to have some secondary goals. Learn a little bit about some motor learning concepts that, that deal with this particular phenomenon. Um, specifically, we're going to deal with feedback, what's called feedback, and practice variability. We're going to evaluate how these particular motor learning concepts can explain this question that we have up here. All right, so let's do some quick housekeeping in the form of just defining certain definitions so we can get into the nitty gritty. Um, so what is it when we talk about feedback? It's information that's external to the athlete. So what a coach gives to an athlete or what um, a parent might give to an athlete. Not to be con confused with what we call sensory feedback. That's feedback that they get perceptually, whether it be whether they hear something, see something, or feel something. That's all sensory feedback. Items in the environment, things about the performance that they can obtain themselves. We're not gonna talk about that. We're gonna talk about feedback, or the general term feedback, which involves information that they cannot get if the coach, parent, whomever is not there. So some examples of that might be um, if any of you are familiar with movement analysis tools such as Dartfish, all that type of inf information is feedback. It doesn't necessarily have to come to a from a computer. It can be from the point of view from a coach, but the main take-home message is that they cannot obtain that information without a third party. So that's the type of feedback that we're going to talk about. Okay, so there are two types of that feedback. There's what's called knowledge of results, and plainly put, this is information about the outcome of the skill. So they've already completed the movement. Um, in a long jump, it could be the distance that they've, that they've jumped. In a throw, it could be the distance that they've, um, that they've thrown. So this is just information about the outcome alone, nothing about the movements. When we try to give them information about the movements, we term this type of feedback knowledge of performance. So this is maybe something more of what a biomechanist deals with. What exactly angles, velocities, forces, etc., that the athlete is, is producing with their particular performance. So we have two types of feedback that we're going to talk about. Okay. So that's, that's kind of, we're done with the house cleaning with definitions, so we'll kind of jump into the meat of feedback and how can, it can explain this phenomenon of producing nice performances that we like to see in practice, but then when we get to that competition, we don't see it. So from a feedback perspective, we have two approaches on how we can give feedback. We have one called the traditional approach, and the tra tra traditional approach, excuse me, says the more feedback you get, the better you learn. The better you learn, the better you're gonna perform in a competition, okay? And the next approach 
is more of a research-based approach. This is an approach that's gotten from the empirical findings of motor learning and control research. And this says, less feedback is better for competition and learning. Okay. Does that sit a little bit funny? So in a sense, the less you say to your athlete, the better it is. Okay. Typically, that's kind of a controversial uh, point right there. But there's a very good, very good evidence, not only from lab-based activities, not only from beginners, but expertise, regardless of the type of skill, we see this phenomenon where the less feedback people get, the better they do in a competition or test style setting. So some common questions that might occur. I'm going to tackle the second question first. How much feedback should you give to your athletes? Less is better than more. And that's the general consensus over a majority, an overwhelming majority of the research findings. Like I said before, regardless